In your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4. Before we get to our text then for this evening, by way of introduction, there have been from time to time throughout the ages, the Lord has been pleased to raise up and prepare what we may refer to as specialists. This is what we would call them, not necessarily referred to that in his word. But as we would call them specialists, and the reason that he calls them is in order to fulfill or to fill the need of the hour or of the day, sometimes of a, of a period of time, we know one that the Lord wanted to build an ark. He raised up one man, Noah. The Lord did not want a, the Lord did not put a help wanted ad in the paper, but instead, beloved, he raised up the individual Noah and he called Noah to build the ark. We do not know how much engineering experience that Noah had prior to building the ark, but we know that the Lord gave him exactly what he needed in order for, to facilitate the building of that ark, and the ark did what the Lord had wanted it to do. Another individual we can look at is the individual Moses. The Lord wanted a person to be able to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and that would have been a grave task in and of itself. But the Lord raised up Moses in order to lead the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Another individual, such individual, would have been the man Gideon, who was a military commander. And though Gideon was somewhat reluctant, a little bit hesitant, and the Lord worked in a mighty way, and he used the individual Gideon once again to provide deliverance for the nation of Israel. We think of David and Goliath and how that the Lord Goliath was there. All of the men of Israel, the Bible says that Goliath was basically blaspheming the name of the Lord. And Goliath was there speaking ill of the Lord. And lo and behold, the Lord had raised up a shepherd boy named David in order to defeat Goliath and to shut his mouth once and for all. We also, beloved, we think of the individual Jonah. Now think with me about this. Oftentimes, what do we think of when we think of Jonah? We might sometimes think of a, somebody who's somewhat hard-headed, somewhat rebellious. But if you stop to think about it, when the Lord wanted to raise up a revival speaker, was that not what Jonah was? He preached and there was a revival. He was a revival speaker. Typically, we would once again, we'd consider him to be rebellious, hard-hearted, hard-headed, uh, disobedient to the things of the Lord. But when the Lord wanted a revival speaker there in the land of Nineveh, lo and behold, the Lord had raised him up and he ended up there and preaching. Sometimes the Lord may use previous experience in a person's life. The reason that we say that is because the individual David. David had killed a lion as well as a bear with his sling prior to the sling of Goliath. In other words, David, I believe that he was a proficient man with the sling. Other times the Lord may take and call someone who doesn't have any experience at all. But lo and behold, he equips them as he calls them. And let me also say this, beloved, the Lord never calls the wrong individual. In other words, when the Lord called Jonah, the Lord did not say, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach. And Jonah said, no, I don't want to. And then the Lord raised up someone else because Jonah wouldn't go. But instead, beloved, the Lord worked in the life of Jonah and the Lord made Jonah willing to go in the process of time. There was absolutely no delay in that, but Jonah arrived in Nineveh exactly when the Lord wanted him to. The Lord never calls the wrong man, and if he calls you, then he will equip you as well. The Lord never delivers the mail to the wrong address, as it is often said, and such is the case with all of the Lord's servants, and such is the case with the individual Elisha. Now let me also say this, beloved, in each and every one of our lives, it was no mistake where the Lord had David at with regards to the time frame. No mistake whatsoever, the Lord knew when David would be born. The Lord knew when David would be coming of age, so on and so forth. And the Lord used David to accomplish a task, just like he used many of the other people. Noah, Jonah, many other people, beloved. Now here's the point, beloved. We're able to read about the experiences of many of those people in the scriptures. But I'd like for you to think for just a moment this evening about this. The Lord has also called each of us to a specific point in time in our lives. In other words, I was born in 1964. The young people don't have to gasp at that, amen. But 
I was born in 1964. The Lord knew exactly when I was going to be born. There was no mistake. I wasn't born too early nor too late. But instead, beloved, the Lord raised up each of his people in the time that he has appointed. And once again, he does so, beloved, to the degree of perfection which only God can do. So the point this evening, beloved, is that if you are here and you're a child of God this evening and you're living and you're breathing, then we know that God has got a purpose for each of us to fulfill. There's no mistakes in the time that we're living in, but we have a purpose to fulfill. And beloved, we must also realize that it will never, ever, ever do for us because as human beings, we tend to be the kind of people that the grass is always greener. There are other periods of history that I think about. I think it would have been a fascinating adventure to have been able to live during the time of Daniel Boone and traveled with Daniel Boone, would it not? But the Lord wasn't pleased to give me life during that time. Instead, the Lord's given me life during this time. Now, here's the point, beloved. None of these men are able to take and say, in other words, David didn't come along and start saying, Lord, I, I don't mind fighting Goliath, but Lord, I'm also a pretty decent carpenter, and I would really rather build you an ark. When Goliath needed to be laid out flat on the ground, there was no need for an ark to be built. When Noah was there building the ark, beloved, there was no giant to slay at that precise time. That wasn't the Lord's plan. There was no need for David to have been around during the time of the ark. But instead, beloved, the Lord raises each of us up to a precise and an impeccable timing in our lives, and God's got a job for each of us to do without question, without reservation whatsoever. But the Lord has all of these things planned out, and it is all according to God's sovereign good pleasure as to who is called to what task, as well as the timing of that calling. Now, if you will look there with me to 2 Kings chapter number 4, 2 Kings chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor who has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then came she and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. Now, beloved, when we think about this miracle that's taking place, it is a little bit different than other miracles that Elisha or Elijah had performed. Now, once again, the facts of the narrative would be this. Here we have a woman who is in absolute desperation. You know, beloved, I do not think that there are any of us who enjoy being in a state of desperation. I don't know of anyone who says, you know what, I just wish something uh, a, a great cataclysmic event would take place in my life and I would film, film, find myself in a state of desperation. I just wish something horrendous would take place and just really fill me with uh, anxiety and tears and a lot of pressure on me. I would really enjoy that. None of us want to be there, beloved. Absolutely none of us. If you're in your right mind, you do not enjoy being in such times as that. But yet the very beginning of the miracle, it starts out by telling us, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. 
Beloved, we live in a blessed time in the fact that no matter how poor you are, we do not have a debtor's prison here in the United States of America. I dare say that none of you have ever lived during a time where there has been a debtor's prison or a place wherein they would come and they would take your children. They'd say, well, you owe so much money because you can't pay it. We're taking your children away and we're going to have them serve in bondage for the money that you owe. We've been blessed in that here in America. Such was not the custom here in the times that we read about, though, to the point that they're saying, we're going to take your sons away. Imagine this woman, she's lost her husband, and now she's in danger of losing her sons. But the woman is in desperation. She'd come to the end of her shell. She'd come to the end of her resources. And she is in this position of absolute desperation, a widow, a wife of a deceased prophet, and she was there in tears. That pretty well describes her life up to this point. She had been apparently a faithful prophet's wife, but she did all that she knew to do, and she went to the man of God. Have you folks ever met someone who they come into a time of dire need in their lives and sometimes people will get very, very, very quiet and they will just clam up? Sometimes I've talked to people and maybe someone will say, man, I've been having this struggle for 20 years. You say, well, have you ever talked to anyone about it? Oh, no, I've just been keeping it to myself. Beloved, if you ever find yourself in a state of desperation, if you find yourself to that point that you feel like I've come to the end of myself, I don't know what to do, I'm just stuck here, do not be shy about reaching out to the right people for help. Reach out. If you're part of this assembly, beloved, there are all kinds of very wise people among the membership of our church, extremely wise people. You may be older, you may be younger, you may be a young lady, a young man. You might be an older lady or an older man, and maybe you're living with some sort of a problem in your life, and up to this point, you've been keeping everything on the down low. Well, had this woman not gone going to Elisha, When she did, beloved, then what would have become of her? But rather she would have stayed there. Now, once again, she was in tears. And her late husband, though evidently he had no money to leave behind, he did leave behind one powerful testimony. Notice there what the scripture says about halfway through verse number one. It says there, thy servant, my husband is dead. Apparently this would have been a man that had known Elisha that would have in a sense served with Elisha or been a servant to Elisha according to the wording there. Thy servant, my husband is dead and thou knowest thy servant did fear the Lord. Beloved, every one of us Whether we want to or not, whether we like the idea of it or not, every one of us, we're going to leave something behind when we die. Now, not everybody will leave money behind. Not everyone's in a position to do that. Not everyone will leave vast resources behind, materially speaking. But every one of us, one way or the other, we will leave a testimony of either faithfulness or unfaithfulness behind when the Lord calls us home. Either when the Lord calls home, people stand around our funeral and say, I'll tell you what, they were one of the most faithful people I ever met. Or people are going to stand around and say, well, they professed they knew the Lord, but I really never seen fruits of it in their life. In other words, beloved, think about what it is that you will leave behind on that day. This woman, her husband had left that testimony behind that he was an individual who the Bible says he feared the Lord And that is all she said about him. It goes on to say, And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Elisha had left evidently this world's wealth behind. As we had pointed out when Elisha was called, the Bible tells that he was plowing, I believe, with 12 yoke of oxen, meaning that they had servants working with them for them there on the farm. But at any rate, Elisha, he did not pull out a check or cash or a coin of gold and take say, well, here, let me give you this money and then everything's going to be fine with you. But if you notice there in verse number two, the Bible says there, and Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? In other words, I know what you need. I know what you're saying. You have no money. They're about to take your, son, your sons for bond servants, but what should I do for you? He goes on to ask the question then. He says, what Hast thou in the house? What hast thou in the house? Now, Elisha seemed to be of the mind 
that there must be something. In other words, that God would not leave this woman totally helpless. Now think with me about this, beloved. Are there not times in our minds, Brother Preston touched on this a little bit on Sunday evening, are there not times in our minds, beloved, that it's almost like in our minds, our minds begin to run. And as our minds begin to run, we may imagine this, we may foresee this, we may think about this. And as our minds begin to run, beloved, it is almost that they can begin to run faster than we have the ability to be able to process. I know many of you probably haven't done it for a long time, but when I was a child, it used to be that if there were a steep hill, you could actually outrun your legs. How many have ever done that? Just a few. Brother Larry, never? Outrun your legs, been running down a hill, and all of a sudden you're going faster than your little legs will carry you? Michelle never chased you like, like that? But there are times, beloved, that if we're not careful, that our minds begin to think thoughts and our minds begin to process thoughts faster than we're la- really we're able to lay them at the feet of the cross. And the problem is not with us or, or the problem is not with the Lord. It's not with our prayers being answered, but it's just the fact that our minds just tend to go haywire. I remember in the Philippines, I've said it many times, that uh, they had something called dengue fever. And the dengue fever comes from mosquito bites. Well, it's a common thing to get 10 or 15 mosquito bites throughout the night, every member of the family just about. Whenever the kids would come up with a high fever, in my mind, old faithless friend, I'd think, well, it's dengue fever. Where am I going to bury my child at? Where where are we going to put them in the hospital at? How bad is it going to hit them? Maybe two days later, they're up bouncing around and they're doing fine. But in other words, beloved, Elisha, he had the mind here because he didn't just tell this woman, you know what, lady, you're on your own. I'll pray for you. And then that's the end of all of it. But instead, Elisha, he asked her the question here, and I noticed that. He said there, Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, comma, save a pot of oil. What do you think her disposition was when she approached approached Elisha. I think she was somewhat of a somber disposition if she were weeping. I think she was of the disposition, beloved, that she evidently thought that this is the end. But in other words, beloved, as he asked the woman, what hast thou in thine house? And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. In other words, that first part of her phrase there, thy handmaid hath not anything in the house. In her mind, that's what she's thinking about. Now, beloved, follow along with me and think about this. If the creditor has been coming, knocking on her door, saying, you know what? You owe me money. And either you give me the money, give me something of value, or else I'm going to be taking your children away from you. In other words, beloved, this is what she's thinking. Now, did she ever one time tell the creditor or go to them and say, you know what, I have a pot of oil here. Let me give you the pot of oil. No, she never did do that. Because in her mind, that pot of oil is not overly valuable. In her mind, it's just a pot of oil. And that's all it is. Elisha said, what do you have in your house? And once again, the Bible says there, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, comma, save a pot of oil. She did not count that pot of oil to amount to very much, did she? She even prefaced it by saying, I didn't have anything in my house but a pot of oil. She didn't say, I have a wedge of gold under my bed. She didn't say, I have a bag of silver under my bed. But instead, beloved, in her heart heart and in her mind, she discounted that pot of oil. And she thought, you know what, it's just kind of a light thing. They're ready to take my children, and I don't know what else to do. In other words, beloved, as she considered that pot of oil, she did not think that it had much value. And to simply look upon it, it would have appeared to be extremely insufficient for the great need that she was facing. The Bible tells us with regards to the people of God and the Holy Spirit of God that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power may be of God, not of us. That's not an exact quote, forgive me for that. 
But it says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In other words, beloved, if you were to look at us, maybe you'd feel like, well, they're, they're just a human being, two eyes, two ears, two arms, two legs. That, they're, they're just an individual. In other words, beloved, there are times that from the human perspective, we may view things which God has placed in our life, and we take and say, you know what? That's not overly significant. That's not all that great. All that is is just a pot of oil. Nothing more, nothing less. It's only a pot of oil. But you see, beloved, as that pot would have appeared to be extremely insignificant. Now think with me about this. What happened when Samuel was sent to look for the next king of Israel? Anybody remember? Samuel went to look for the next king of Israel. And as he went to look for the next king of Israel... Lo and behold, Jesse, he said, I'm, I'm basically here. And he said, uh, uh, I'd like to see your sons in so many words. And so Jesse, he starts at the eldest and he starts bringing the children by the individual Samuel. And Samuel would look at these men and Samuel would take and say, you know what? It's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this one. And finally, he said, do you have, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that this is the right address here, Jesse. I'm sure that this is where the Lord has brought me to. Are you sure you don't have any other sons at all here, Jesse? Jesse said, well, pff, the baby of the family, he's out there tending the sheep. But he's pretty well just young. I mean, he's really not, not all that much to look at. I mean, as far as being a great leader, he wasn't much to look at. But lo and behold, when he ended up coming by, Samuel, Samuel said, this is the man. He might not look like much to you, but in the sight of God, this is the man. This is it. You see, in other words, beloved, whenever they looked upon David, they would just feel like that he was a ruddy shepherd boy. But yet that ruddy shepherd boy was the one that the Lord used to be the greatest general that the nation of Israel had ever had. Literally, the greatest general that Israel had ever had. He didn't look like much, but God's hand was upon him. When there were several thousand people in New Testament times, and lo and behold, those people grew hungry. And uh, the disciples said to Christ, they said, let's send the people away because they're getting hungry. And then Christ said, well, what, what do we have here? What kind of food do we have? It wasn't that they had 10 semi-loads of, of fish nuggets, amen, or chicken strips. What did they have? You all wake up. Some of you men help me out. What'd they have? Five loaves, two fish. You know what? Those people, they would sit there and they'd take and say, Lord, uh, we, Lord boy, I'll tell you, Lord, this is our inventory. You've sent us out to get an inventory, Lord, and we have one young man here. We have 5,000 people over here, plus women and children, and then we have this one young man who brought his sack lunch of five loaves and two fishes. Lord, that's about it. And if you would have taken and looked at that sack lunch, and then you look over there at those 5,000 people, that sack lunch would not have looked like very much at all, would it? Wouldn't look like much at all. <clears throat> have you women ever been in a position that maybe you have some surprise visitors to your home and you feel like, well, you know what? I have some leftover chicken in the fridge. I'll get it out and I'll feed it to them. And you get that Tupperware bowl of chicken out, and as you get it out to feed it to them, there's not quite as much there as you thought. Any of you ladies ever been in that position? And then you feel maybe a little bit sheepish because you're thinking, man, that, that's barely going to suffice for anything. Now here's the point, beloved. As they began to distribute, Christ had told the disciples, he said, make them sit down in companies. In other words, beloved, the disciples, they're there looking at these five loaves and two fishes. And then Christ is saying, make them sit down. And in the mind of the apostles, beloved, once again, if they would have been leaning to human understanding, they would have said, Master, you're, you're going to make us all look kind of silly here. Five loaves and two fishes and 5,000 plus people. Lord, these loaves and fishes, they look awful and insignificant. Well, this woman is also there saying, 
What do, you, what do I have in my house? I didn't have anything but a pot of oil, and that's all that I have in my house. Now, here's the thing, beloved. Oftentimes, we may have something in our lives, and if we look at it, we may feel as though, you know what? That's insufficient for the task. That is not going to work out for what I need it to work out for, and I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. But you see, beloved, there is a beautiful saying. Oftentimes, it's even a song that we sing sometimes. Little is much when God is in it. Amen? Now think about this. He goes on to tell her back there in the book of 2 Kings in chapter number 4 and verse 3. The Bible says there, Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Beloved, as he says there, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. And then he goes on to say, Borrow not a few. Do not ever underestimate that every word of God is inspired by God and it is placed there for a purpose. There are no words in the scriptures, beloved, that the Lord just said, well, I'll just add this in there. That way I'll come up with enough words on the page. That's not the case at all. But as Elisha had told her, borrow these vessels. And he says there, borrow not a few. Now, every word is important when it comes to the scriptures. But even as he'd said there, borrow not a few. Now, what she had said there then in verse number four, the Bible goes on to say, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door. Now, beloved, remember this. I do not know how it is for you folks. Sometimes I get a little bit high strung. And if someone begins to give me instructions or they begin to give me direction, my brain will be a little bit scattered sometimes, especially if it's something of great significance, if it's something that's really, 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 really important, and then someone gives me instruction, sometimes my mind will begin, yeah, uh, now, now, let's see, you said, come on in and do this. Is that right now? Now, I want to make sure that I don't forget anything at all. Well, as he tells her this, and when thou art come in... Thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Now, beloved, let me just ask you folks the question. I have the water bottle here and we've all read the Bible plenty of times. But you know what? If I were to tell you folks to bring a whole bunch of five-gallon buckets here tonight and we're having a water shortage and I say, you know what? It's not a problem at all. If we all bring a lot of five-gallon buckets, I'm going to take this water bottle here into the baptistry changing room and I'm going to begin filling up water buckets out of this one bottle of water. What would you all think about that? Now, obviously, we're able to look at the Bible and say, well, during Bible times, it's different. Absolutely. During Bible time, there were actual miracles still being taken place, still being performed. But if I were to tell you folks today that I'm going to fill up 100 five-gallon buckets out of this one bottle of water, honestly, what would you think of me? You lost it. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Brother Dennis isn't shy at all. Amen. He'd say, I'm sure most of us would sit there and say, Brother Spears, you, you must not understand about units of measure here because if you have even one five-gallon bucket, you cannot fill one five-gallon bucket up out of one, what, eight-ounce bottle of water, six, whatever it is. You cannot fill that one bucket of water up out of that one bot water bottle. In other words, you would realize, beloved, you say, you're not understanding here. Now, here's the point, beloved. Once again, I've been meditating once again, upon Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Now, if Elisha had given her these instructions, and then Elisha would have taken as he gave her those instructions, if she would have said, well, phew, man, I'll tell you what, maybe, maybe there's someone else I can go to. Elisha, you've been spending too much time in the sun, buddy, because I have this one oil pot, and that is all I have, and I cannot fill up dozens and dozens. We did not know how many vessels there was. I cannot fill all of those things up out of this one oil pot. But it says there, and when thou, in verse 4, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee, and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. She went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. Now notice that next and last phrase there, And the oil stayed. Beloved, 
I believe according to the word of God that she had as much oil in that one oil pot when she was finished filling all of those vessels as she did when she started. That's the miracle. That is God, the one that is doing that there. Now the Lord had told her to shut the door. Once again, the people would have been nosy. These would have no doubt been clay pots also. They wouldn't have been glass jars as we would have had in our day, but they would have been clay pots where she would have had her one jug and she wouldn't be able to look at that jug and say, well, it's half full, quarter full. And as she's pouring out the oil into these other pots, it would have been hard to have told how much oil was in those. But beloved, think with me about this. Every time that she poured, every one of those things that she poured, this woman was pouring in faith, not by sight. In other words, if she would have said, well, my oil bottle is this big, the vessel I'm filling up is this big around, so lo and behold, it's just going to be a drop in the bucket. But beloved, she continued to pour and pour and pour and pour and pour until all of those other vessels were full. And she came to the place, beloved, that the Bible says there that the oil had stayed. Now let me ask you a question, beloved, that oftentimes comes to my mind as I read this passage. What if she would have borrowed more containers? What if? Think she could have filled those two? I believe she could have. Yes. Wouldn't have been a problem at all. But we do not really know how or why it is, beloved. We do not know if she thoroughly exhausted all of her neighbors for their supply on pots or if she only went to a handful. We do not want to build her faith up too high nor diminish her faith in one iota because the Bible doesn't say. But we do not know, beloved, if she tried, if she exhausted all resources at getting containers or if she only borrowed a few. But you see, beloved, there are times that if we're not careful that we limit ourselves by limiting God. How's that square with your theology? There are times when we hear that expression, limiting God. And the truth is that it doesn't quite square with our theology oftentimes to the point, to be honest with you, that we can almost recoil away from it. But do you remember when Christ was traveling in the New Testament and the Bible says there, and he could there not do many mighty works, could not do, it doesn't say would not do, but he could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. And the Bible says that he marveled at it, at their unbelief. In other words, beloved, if this woman would have taken and said, okay, son, bring me in one or two pots. I mean, I have one oil jug here. Bring two pots and that's going to be about good enough. Elisha didn't tell her to gather 100 pots, 500 pots, or 10 pots. He didn't give her a number of pots. But the point is, beloved, is according to the scriptures, the Bible says then in verse number 7, Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children on the rest. You see, beloved, God provided all of her needs even in the absence of her late husband. Do we not see this among our widow ladies here at church? God's still providing their needs. God is still faithfully, beloved, working all of those things out. Now, once again, I want you to notice there the very last thing is this. The Bible does not say, as she was closing things out there, the Bible doesn't say that she filled all the pots and then ran out of oil, but rather what the Bible says is that she was asking for more vessels. She ran out of vessels to be able to pour the oil into. And the Bible says of the original oil pot that the oil stayed in that pot. In other words, there was still oil in that pot that it could have poured into another vessel. Now think with me about this, beloved. God provided the oil, and it was an unlimited supply of oil. And the woman was the one who had provided the pots, and the pots was the thing that stopped her or caused her to cease from being able to pour out more oil. Now I'm not saying that she should have been a greedy woman. I'm not saying that the Lord would have blessed that. But what I am saying this evening is this, beloved. Oftentimes in our lives, we need to take and just trust God, simply trust God for what he says that he will do. And we do not need to be comparing one pot to another pot saying, well, Lord, I know what you're saying, but Lord, this is just impossible for this to be able to come to pass. And Lord, I'm sorry, but it's just not logical. Beloved, God works outside the realm of all of our logic and of all of our understanding. 
In other words, beloved, God is not subject to the logic of man. We, we see this many times in the scriptures. When the sun stood still, we realize, beloved, God was the one that did that. And we see it over and over again, beloved, when the Lord works miracles in the lives of his children. But, beloved, the thing about it is, as we, what we must take away from the narrative here with regards to the widow and her oil pot is that the Lord cared for her even through the midst of all of those things. And he will continue to care for each of us today as though we are the only one on the face of the earth. Sometimes we may feel as though, well, I'm kind of small or my needs are insignificant and God is awful busy taking care of other people that he doesn't have time for me. But the truth is, beloved, that God cares for every one of his children as though we're, we were the only ones on the face of the earth. And he does so, beloved, impeccably. The Bible tells in the book of Psalms, chapter number 146, the Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. Beloved, the Lord speaks many times with regards to the fatherless and the widows. And even as this woman was able to take and sell that surplus of oil, and the Bible says for her to live on that which remained, God met and provided every one of her needs. I did not really know where any of you are at specifically in life. I did not know maybe some of you stand in need of money. Maybe someone stands in need of something else. Maybe others stand in need of yet something else. But I will tell you this, beloved. God is faithful to provide for the needs of his people. And the King, King David had said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Beloved, he who purchased our souls there upon the cross of Calvary and who, he who paid the price for all of our redemption, he's still meeting the needs of his people today. May we continue to look unto him in faith.